Benjamin Labatut, the Maniac John von Neumann has been called the smartest man who ever lived. Born in Hungary, the mathematician and polymath revolutionized fields like computer science, economics, and nuclear strategy, and made important contributions to many others. Insatiably curious, he consumed science like lesser minds consume popcorn. His friend group included Nobel laureates, yet none rivaled him. The Maniac offers a literary look into this strange and brilliant mind. It explores the fine line between genius and madness, asking what happens when human rationality is taken to extremes. We follow von Neumann's story from his early years as a precocious talent in Hungary to his groundbreaking work developing game theory and his contributions to quantum mechanics and the atom bomb. While labeled as fiction, the maniac blurs the line between factual historical recounting and creative embellishment. The story is told through the words of many characters, real-life friends, relations, and colleagues who encountered von Neumann throughout his life. You'll encounter some of them in this blank. Labatut gives you a lens into the triumphs and demons that haunted one of history's greatest minds and asks you to consider the consequences of human reason taken beyond all limits. Unthinkable Reason It's September 1933. Physicist Paul Ehrenfest shoots and kills his disabled teenage son, Vasily, before turning the gun on himself. Ehrenfest, though gifted, has grappled with severe self-doubt and inferiority his whole life. He has tormented himself over his contributions to physics, which he considers inadequate. Later in life, his troubles descend into obsession as he struggles to grasp the implications of the new theories being developed by physicists like Bohr and Heisenberg. At its core, quantum physics reveals a probabilistic, uncertain atomic world that unsettles Ehrenfest's belief in the harmony of nature. The cold, mathematical approach of physicists like John von Neumann disturbs him, contradicting his mechanistic conception of the universe and plunging him into an existential and intellectual crisis. Ehrenfest experiences a brief period of euphoria, believing himself to have solved some enduring physics problems relating to turbulence. But he soon realizes that he's mistaken. His theory doesn't work. Ehrenfest's final slide into the abyss is prompted by the rise of Nazism in Germany. The spread of militaristic fervor horrifies him, as do eugenics and the cruel treatment of the mentally ill. Afraid for his vulnerable son Vasily's future, and despondent for humanity and himself, he decides death is the only solution. Chillingly, Ehrenfest emotionlessly boards a train to Amsterdam to carry out his violent plan. Ehrenfest's horrific action might well prompt you to ask, what could possibly drive a father to murder his own child? The rest of the section seeks to unpack the turmoil leading to this tragedy. Intellectual concerns worry Ehrenfest deeply. The new mathematical theories of quantum physics seem somehow profoundly dehumanizing in their abstraction. We're losing touch with physical intuition, somehow unmooring all of us from reality. This section establishes a central theme, a suggested link between pure reason and a kind of inhumanity. Ehrenfest experiences fear in witnessing impersonal forces beyond humanity, alien and uncaring. His story is a lens through which we're invited to see the life of the central character, the mathematician and polymath John von Neumann. Terrifying Genius Janusz Lauz Neumann was born in 1903 into a wealthy Jewish family in Hungary. His lifelong friend and fellow scientist Eugene Wigner recounts his early life. Janusz arrives at Wigner and his elite Hungarian school in 1914, the same year World War I begins. Even as a young boy, he astounds his teachers with his brilliant intellect. An early glimpse of his intellect comes from his mathematics tutor, Gaber Sege. After the first meeting, Sege comes home in tears, clutching crumpled papers on which he'd written problems that had stumped him for months. Problems that Janusz has casually solved. Janusz is just ten years old. Sege knows, even then, that this boy will alter the course of mathematics. In school, Janusz devours knowledge, reading textbooks voraciously, even taking two heavy volumes to the toilet for fear of a break in stimulation. 
Teachers often employ him as an assistant because his mastery exceeds theirs. As a teenager, he publishes advanced academic papers. When presented with intriguing questions, Janusz sinks into a shadowy corner, shoulders hunched as if physically transformed within his own mind. Eyes drilling the floor, he shifts on his feet, lost in thought, until snapping back with a comprehensive solution minutes later. The intensity of his concentration unsettles his peers, his features taking on an almost inhuman, mechanical aura. Janusz was an enigma, a fact underlined by a story told by his brother Nicholas. Nicholas recalls when his father brought home an elaborate 19th century jacquard loom, capable of weaving intricate patterns from punch cards. While Nicholas was bored by the machine, Janusz was enthralled. He spent two whole days taking the loom apart and trying to understand how it worked, missing meals and playtime. One night, Janusz panicked because he couldn't figure out how to reassemble the loom. Fearing their father would be angry and take it away, Janusz desperately tried to fix it. Nicholas stayed up all night to help, fighting his exhaustion. Nicholas describes a recurring nightmare that has haunted him ever since. In this nightmare, the demonic loom springs to life, chasing him. With sharp hooks and red threads trailing behind, Janusz rides atop the loom fiercely, like a conqueror commanding his army. In another section, we hear directly from Gaber Sege, the young von Neumann's humiliated tutor. Now a mathematics professor, he recounts meeting his former pupil in Berlin in the late 1920s. Janusz is now a renowned and influential scientist and intellectual. And in light of the growing Nazi threat, Sege meets with him seeking his assistance in helping his family migrate from Germany to America. Over an extravagant lunch at Horcher, a lavish restaurant whose clientele includes high-ranking members of the Nazi party, Janusz speaks breathlessly about new discoveries in quantum physics. He's become obsessed with formalizing mathematics, convinced it holds the key to understanding the fundamental nature of the universe. Sege fears for Janusz and pleads with him to move to America, but Janusz brushes him off, eager to work with Germany's top mathematicians. As they leave the restaurant, they encounter a military procession that enthralls Janusz, who admires the tanks and military hardware. Despite his reluctance to leave, von Neumann finally flees Germany for the United States, where he will spend the rest of his life as John Johnny von Neumann. This early section on von Neumann's life provides deeper insight into his singular mind, brilliance, but also his inscrutable and even alienness. The story of the Jockward Loom shows a boy of frightening intellectual intensity and single-minded obsession trying to understand the world in clear, cold detail. The Loom Nightmare represents the themes of inhuman rationality and terrible intelligence embodied by figures like von Neumann, hinting at Promethean overreach. His revolutionary ideas changed the course of mathematics, economics, and computer science, yet somehow emptied his own life of intimacy and common understanding. Nicholas's recurring nightmare ominously foreshadows von Neumann's later role in developing technology used for destruction. The later scene with the tanks both encapsulates Germany's dangerous political currents and again foreshadows Janusz's role in empowering destructive forces. Attention is drawn to evidence of Janusz's alarming amorality and lack of wisdom. Do these feelings arise despite his great intellect? Or are they somehow in keeping with it? Von Neumann in America For the rest of his life, von Neumann, now John or Johnny, lives in America. Johnny's second wife, Clara, or Clary, Dan, describes their turbulent marriage and life together. Johnny takes a position at Princeton's Institute for Advanced Study. There, he develops a rivalry with Albert Einstein. Von Neumann mocks Einstein's clothes and pacifism, while Einstein sees von Neumann as childish and nihilistic, calling him a mathematical weapon. After von Neumann witnesses the first atomic blast at Los Alamos, he becomes obsessed with advancing technology at any cost. Clary realizes her husband has conceived one of humanity's most dangerous ideas a solution to the nuclear threat. This idea is described by Oscar Morgenstern, an economist and friend of von Neumann. Work on understanding stock markets sparks von Neumann's curiosity about modeling human conflict. Von Neumann and Morgenstern then partner to create a general mathematical theory of games. 
game theory is a mathematical framework for modeling strategic decision-making in competitive situations involving multiple players. It attempts to find the most rational choices available to participants based on their opponents' likely actions, and applies to countless human domains from personal negotiations to geopolitics. But military strategists seize upon their theory. When Russia develops its own nuclear weapons, U.S. policy becomes that of mutually assured destruction, or MAD. In this policy, nuclear attacks are deterred by possessing enough weapons to guarantee the complete annihilation of both the attacker and defender. Morgenstern is haunted by the role of their theory in all this. He also wonders if game theory truly models human behavior, since people diverge wildly from perfect rationality. This strange angel of irrationality, he concludes, protects humanity from the dangerous dream of pure reason. We again see a recapitulation of the tension between pure mathematical reason and humanist ethics, here personified by the conflict between von Neumann and Einstein. Game theory also demonstrates von Neumann's abstract and computational approach to humanity. Von Neumann's solution to the nuclear threat is just logical enough to work, but psychopathic in its rationality. Mutually assured destruction is a precarious balance of terror, one that has avoided nuclear war, but for how long, and at what cost? Morgenstern intuits that societies require something beyond reason alone. Raw intelligence must somehow be tempered by human wisdom. A Computer Age Dawning Julian Bigelow is a computer engineer. He describes his chance encounter with von Neumann, by then a renowned mathematician and weapons consultant. Bigelow mentions his classified work on ENIAC, the first digital computer built for artillery calculations. Intrigued, von Neumann demands to see the machine himself and hires Bigelow to help build an even better computer. With no building space allotted, Bigelow and von Neumann set up shop in Kurt Gödel's unused secretary's office, drawing inspiration from his pioneering work on computability theory. Exiled to the basement, they toil for years to construct von Neumann's blueprint for a stored program computer based on the visions of Alan Turing. Although cobbled together from scrap parts, their mathematical analyzer, numerical integrator, and computer, or maniac, proves to be 20 times faster than ENIAC. The military funds their work, seeking faster computation for weapons research. But von Neumann dreams bigger. He dreams of revolutionizing all scientific fields by unleashing unlimited calculation. His understanding of the importance of the computer is prophetic. For the remainder of his life, von Neumann continues making contributions to science. He conducts pioneering work on artificial life. He formalizes biological concepts of self-replication a decade before Watson and Crick discovered the function of DNA. He even works on weather prediction and control. Von Neumann's last, unfinished work is A Theory of Self-Reproducing Automata, describing, among other things, artificial life. Von Neumann is struck by tragedy. A tumor is found near his collarbone, and he's diagnosed with cancer. He's terrified of his impending death. And as the cancer spreads to his brain, he loses his mathematical ability completely. It takes from him what is by far his most precious possession, his mind. Relatives describe this loss as perhaps the greatest pain they've ever seen a human being face. In the end, he loses his sanity completely. Toward the end of his days, von Neumann becomes fearful of humanity's future and of the role that advancing technology will play. Progress, he says will become incomprehensibly rapid and complicated. And yet, it is not the particularly perverse destructiveness of one particular invention that creates danger. The danger is intrinsic. For progress, there is no cure. Von Neumann's encounter with ENIAC and subsequent feverish work on MANIAC shows again his single-minded pursuit of technological progress for its own sake. And yet, As his own mortality begins to approach, von Neumann grows fearful of it. Von Neumann's unfinished work on self-replicating automata shows technology and biology blurring. Much like the demonic, self-directed loom of his brother's nightmare, he's helped unleash advanced mechanical systems whose outcomes cannot be predicted. 
In the final part of this narrative, themes of fearsome intelligence will reach another stage in the development of artificial intelligence. Leaving Humanity Behind Lee Sedol is a Korean child prodigy who from the age of five becomes obsessed with the ancient game of Go. Enrolling in a specialized academy, he studies the game incessantly, 12 hours a day, seven days per week. Though shy and awkward, Sedol is creatively brilliant. His unique and intuitive play soon makes him a top player, one whose play becomes even more aggressive and impulsive after his father's death. After winning dozens of titles, Sadal is considered the greatest Go player of the modern era. But in March 2016, he faces a new challenge. A five-game match with the AI system AlphaGo. Sadal is confident. Go has long been seen as too intuitive and complex for machines to master, but AlphaGo stuns the world, winning the first three games decisively. In Game 4, facing humiliation, a desperate Sadal unfurls a move of pure creative madness. This single shocking play upends the game and sends Alpha Go into a tailspin. He wins Game 4, preventing a sweep. While ultimately losing the match, Sadal's creative play seemed to show that human victory was possible, prompting rapturous celebrations of humanity's ingenuity. In the aftermath, Sadal adopts a more calculating, precise style, forswearing reliance on instinct. But the match seems to crush his pride and fighting spirit. Less than four years later, aged just 36, Sadal retires from professional play, declaring humans incapable of staying at the top of Go. AlphaGo has now bested the top human player on Earth. What next? DeepMind then takes the final step. They take their latest version of AlphaGo and strip it of all traces of human gameplay data. They give it just the bare rules and have it learn the game solely by playing millions and millions of games against itself. They dub this new creation Alpha Zero, and it's unstoppable. When pitted against Alpha Go, the one which defeated Sadal, Alpha Zero crushes it utterly, winning 100 games to zero. It seems a new era has begun. The story arcs back to the themes introduced at the beginning. The tension between humanistic values and unchecked technological progress. A parallel is created between von Neumann and AlphaGo. Von Neumann represents the archetype of the brilliant but amoral scientist, pursuing knowledge and innovation for its own sake, while standing apart from humanity. AlphaZero's superhuman skill springs entirely from algorithms and computation alone. Its learning from self-play means that its connection to humanity has been severed. In The Maniac, it suggested that technologies like this are ambivalent achievements. Humanity has now permanently relinquished areas of intellect, like Go and chess, that we created. Our vaunted intuition is no match for the cold, inscrutable algorithms of the machines. <laughs>